Happy Sunday. Thanks so much for being with us today at Life Center, whether you're worshiping with us at home or you're here in the room. Glad that you're here. If I haven't met you, my name's Tyler. and thrilled that you're taking a part of your Sunday to be with us. Uh, today, we continue on in a journey that we started a number of weeks ago where we're exploring the idea of the good life. Can you say the good life? The good life. We uh, collectively have begun this journey to ask the question, what does it actually look like to experience the good life? And even before we get there, I want you to know that as Life Center, we are on a mission together to help every life in our communities experience life in Jesus. Because we believe that that's where the good life is found. Now, as we consider this, here's what I want you to do right now at the top of the message. In front of you, if you're here in the room, there is a connect card. Would you grab that? We're gonna use that in a few moments. Reach in, grab that. For those who are watching with us online, the team's gonna put a link up a little bit later. Or as well, if you have the Life Center app, you can grab that and get ready because we're gonna be referring to that in just a few moments. But as we go on this journey to discover the good life, here's what we've come to understand. Most people's pursuit of the good life leads them to a place where they're hurried, they're busy, they're overstretched, they're grinding it out, they're moving fast, trying to get to a place that either ultimately they, they realize we've arrived at an ideal that doesn't actually exist or that I'll never actually be able to get to. In fact, a few weeks ago when I opened, I, I asked this question, what does the good life look like for you? I asked the crowd, I said, okay, if you could close your eyes and imagine, fill in the blank of what the good life is, what would it look like? And most of us, we, we would say, you know what? It would include some more vacation. It would include a bigger house, a faster car, it would include the ability to eat whatever I want, whenever I want, and the calories have zero impact on my life. How many of you know that sounds like the good life, doesn't it? But here's where that led us to, because how many people define the good life, what they're defining is ultimately either an escape from reality or an escape from responsibility. Because there is no reality that exists where you can eat whatever you want, whenever you want, and it has no impact on your life. There's no place where no responsibility exists where you don't have to shoulder some things that come along with living this thing called life. And our whole point is that when it comes to walking out or experiencing the good life, Jesus has a different way. Jesus has a different way. And today, I've entitled this talk, Consider it. Consider it. Because I want us to consider the impact that happens in our lives when we create margin for relationship. When we create margin for relationship. You know, in our family, in the Soli household, every Christmas season, we have a tradition. We have multiple traditions, but one of our traditions is we will get a new puzzle and we will set out a card table, and little by little through December, we will chip away at working on a puzzle together. That might sound crazy to you, but maybe you have a little bit of a rhythm like that. Anybody else, your family does something kind of like this? All right, a number of us. Uh, so this last year, I hold in my hand the Soli family puzzle from December. It's the classic cover of the New Yorker magazine with ski stuff on it. Our family, we love to ski. And we set out in December to begin to put this puzzle together little by little. And everybody knows when you put a puzzle together, you begin with the, the border, right? You begin with the edge and, and you work your way in. And it, it kind of starts out slow and little by little, you're making progress. You're, you're creating traction and our team would, or our family would walk by and add a couple of pieces here or there. But then you reach this tipping point when you're putting a puzzle together where all of a sudden you realize, man, we're, we're getting close, we're getting closer. And that tipping point happened where one night it went from just a few minutes to let's get this thing done. So all five of us are standing around this table and we're getting there, 750 piece puzzle. We finally find the last piece. We put the piece in, we step back, look at the puzzle and we realize we're missing a piece. And can I tell you, 
that after spending not just a few hours, but like days working on that as a family, there's like this moment in our house where everybody's like, where is the last piece? And everybody starts looking all over the house. Somebody's checking the box. Everybody's looking under tables. I'm grabbing our dog and opening its mouth going, where is the puzzle piece? Trying to find it. And here was the challenge. The puzzle had 750 pieces. 749 did not feel quite right. You look at it and you're like, well, and, and by the way, if you're wanting a good deal on a puzzle, come talk to me after today. Um, I'll sell you a 749 piece puzzle. Why was there frustration? Why was there challenge? Well, it felt incomplete. Something was missing. And the problem was each piece, you, you grab them and each individual piece, man, you're, you're looking at it and it takes time. It takes intentionality. You have to consider where each piece fits and belongs over and over 749 times. You're, you're placing each piece. Why? Because each piece has a, a purpose, a, a place, a part to play. You know what I love about puzzle pieces? The shapes are different. The colors are different. The sizes are different. But also, here's what I've noticed about puzzle pieces. You see, individually, an individual piece cannot be what it's designed to be without connection. This piece is a great piece. It's got some shades of blue, some shades of green. Go Seahawks. Maybe too soon. I don't know. We'll see. But it's got some unique features to it. But this piece is not designed to just be a single piece. It's incomplete without connection. But the same is true on the broader sense about the collective puzzle. You see, the collective puzzle, it can't accomplish its purpose, capture this, without each piece. So the individual piece is missing what it's designed to be without the whole, and the whole will miss what it's designed to be without each individual piece. It reminds me a lot of how we function as followers of Jesus. See, over the years, I've heard a lot of people say, well, Tyler, I have a, a personal relationship with Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't need to be connected. I, I have a personal walk with Jesus. And here's the challenge, though what you're saying is theologically accurate, it's also incomplete. Because we are saved individually, but Jesus, he saves us to be a part of community, in other words, his body. We cannot be individually what we are called and designed to be collectively. We need connection. We need connection. It matters. It is Important, And here's something that we must consider. The life that God has given you is not just designed to be spent. There's a lot of individuals who say, well, it's my life. I, I get to spend it how I want. That, it's true. You can make that decision. But your life that God has given you or entrusted to you, it's not designed just to be spent. It's actually designed to share. You see, I receive from others in the body of Christ, but I'm also called to share with others what God has, has given me. Our lives are designed for connection. In fact, in Genesis, we read this, that there is a good God who set into motion a good creation. Do you know that scripture starts with what is good and not what is bad? It's important for us to remember. There's a good God who set into motion a good creation but in this good creation, God looked at one thing and said, that's not good. And what is that? It's not good for man to be alone. See, let me address a few clarifying things about relationship. Because I know some of us right now, especially depending on how we are wired, our personality, uh, the, the way that we've grown up, some of us are getting a little bit uncomfortable going, Tyler, I'm not really a relationship person. I I'm much more comfortable just being an individual who has a relationship with Jesus, but that whole connection thing, that's not really me. Here's what I know. Just like there's different shapes, sizes, colors, when it comes to puzzle pieces, the same is true in the body of Christ. There's, there's variety. There's, there's difference. But 
few things about relationship that I want us to remember because some of us today, some of us in the room, we are introverts. Any introverts in the house? Did you notice how dead silent it was? That's how you know they're with us, okay? Any extroverts in the house? All right, okay. There you go, yep. Extroverts are still waking up because last night they were up late having all these conversations, all right? But here's what happens. Sometimes, for those of us who are maybe more introverted in life, we would say, well, Tyler, I don't need or I don't want more relationship. I heard an analogy a number of years ago that was really helpful. It went like this. Introverts, when they wake up in the morning, they start the day with like three to six coins. And every interaction that they have with another person, it takes a coin from them. And so that, that interaction that you have with your boss, you're like, okay, that was two coins. The conversation that you have with your spouse, there's another coin. Your kids scream, there's a few coins. The person who, who cuts you off and uses sign language, I'm just done for the day, right? Like, you just, you want to be home, reach out. I don't want to see another human. How many of you have ever had a day like that where you're like, I am done with humanity? Now, that's, that's a metaphor, an analogy of how introverts oft, often function. Extroverts, on the other hand, so for those of you who are more introverted, if you want to know how extroverts work, this is how they work. They wake up in the morning with zero coins. And every interaction that they have, they get a coin. And so it's like this exciting adventure, like, I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to get a coin. And I'm going to go talk to you, and I'm going to get another coin. And I'm going to talk to somebody who doesn't even want to talk to me because it's giving me a coin, and I know it's depleting them, but I get a coin, and I feel better about myself. Come on, extroverts, where are you at? That's how you function. And depending on how you are wired will challenge your perspective of what you believe about connection. Extroverts, we want connection. Introverts, we don't always want connection, or at least we, we want a certain amount that is manageable to us. But, but here's the point. Whether you're introverted or extroverted, we need connection. See, another thing about relationship that we got to understand, relationship is not equal to proximity. You can be all around people and still not actually deep in relationship. And this is one of the things that as Life Center, we must be aware of. Why? Because we are gathered together. I mean, look around the room. There's a lot of people in the room today. And, and we can convince ourselves, well, I'm in relationship because I'm around people. But can I tell you, a number of years ago, I, I took a flight. And the person sitting next to me, they assumed that not only the armrest was theirs, but part of my seat was theirs. I spent four hours on a flight feeling somebody's arm hair that I did not sign up for. Can I tell you, there was proximity, but that is not relationship. And you can be all around people, you can be in proximity and still not be in relationship. Not only that, information does not equal relationship. See, this is one of our dangers as well, is we can know somebody at Life Center. We, we can know their name. We could even know their occupation. But, but are we actually connected in relationship? Have we made that connection? Again, the point here is whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, we need to understand that we not only need friendship, but we need biblical community and connection. We need one another. And this matters, why? Because people rarely drift into deep, meaningful community. People rarely accidentally end up deep connection with other people. So my question is, what, is, what does connection look like for your life? I want you to consider that for a moment as we go to Acts chapter two. I wanna read a few verses out of the book of Acts. And this really serves almost like a thesis statement for the early church. It says this in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. It says, they devoted themselves. Don't, don't miss that. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled with awe and many wonder signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together. Can you say together? They were together and they held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Man, how many of you would love to be able to say that about our day, that every single day God is adding people to those who are being saved? And yet, here's what I recognize. Sometimes we want first century results without doing what the first century did. We, we want to see signs and wonders. We want to see miracles. We want to see God adding to the number every day. But are we willing to lean into that type of connection? Are we willing to lean in to community? You see, I think it's important that often we can try to create first century community, but we try to do it on a 21st century timetable. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. See, my assumption is many of us, we'd, we'd love to say, you know what, I, I want to see God do today what he was doing then, but are we willing to do today what our ancestors in the faith understood as important? Notice what they did. They, they devoted themselves. In other words, they, they made a decision. They had to consider it. They, they made the decision for connection. And where that led them was to a daily reality, not just a weekly routine. No, I'm, am I saying like, you gotta be in a small group every day, you gotta be eating at somebody's house every, no, not at all. But in how we live out this faith, it wasn't just a calendar stop on a Sunday or a weekend, it was a daily reality in their lives. And what's the byproduct? Well, they are helping people not only make decisions, they are ultimately making disciples. Can I remind you, that is our call as well. Life Center, we want to make disciples who can know how to make disciples, who can know how to make disciples. That's how we make multiplication impact throughout the generations. And yet there's this word that shows up multiple times in Acts chapter 2. What is that? Fellowship. Fellowship. See, at the end of the day, fellowship, it's not just about me knowing somebody. It's also about me being known. Knowing and being known. And here's where the rubber hits the road for us today. Community takes connection. A lot of us, we, we want to experience community, but understand this. Community takes connection. And here's the problem. Connection requires time. And time is a choice. Community takes connection. Connection requires time. And time is a choice. Here's what I want to commit to you. Life Center will do everything we can do to try to help create community and connection points. That's why we have programs and ministries for every age, every generation. We, we have life groups and classes and all these different things. And, and Life Center will do what we can do, but understand, you must do what only you can do. Because even though Life Center might be providing opportunity, if I make the choice to not try to see where I fit and where I can connect, you must do what only you can do. You must do what only you can do. See, how often do, do I hear or even say things like this? Have you ever been here where, where you say to somebody, we got to get together soon? And then it's not like a couple of days go by, it's like a month later you realize, oh man, I forgot to do that. Or what about this one? Let's do lunch in a few weeks when things settle down. Can I ask, did they actually settle down? No, it actually got faster, didn't it? And I, I gotta stand before you, like I am the chief sinner in this one. So those of you who are ready to throw a rock, go ahead and throw it. But, but I, I have great intent Man, we should get together. I'd love to grab coffee. I'd love to grab lunch. And, and my intent is good, but the challenge is my impact is bad. Because life has a way of getting busy. We, we want to connect, but it's sometimes hard to take one step in the direction of more connection. And that's my challenge for each of us today. How do, how do we take one step? Because my guess is there's some who are in the room today, and you're busy. 
In fact, to get on your schedule, it's looking like a couple of months out from now. And if that's where you're at, man, I get it. I understand. But for you to have meaningful connection, instead of just setting things out two months, could you maybe on your commute, instead of listening to that next podcast, maybe you set the podcast aside and you make a phone call. Did you know, by the way, that smartphones call? All the introverts are ticked at me right now, like, stop it! Stop it, I don't want people to call me. Just text me. But listen, imagine what could happen if you simply found somebody that you called, you checked in on, you prayed with as you were driving to work or home from work. One step closer to meaningful connection. You see, if we think that we can fit deep connection and community in the cracks of an overloaded schedule, we need to think again. Wise people don't try to microwave friendship, parenting, or marriage. Have you noticed that you can't do community in a hurry? Have you noticed that you can't listen in a hurry? No matter how hard I try every now and then, I'm trying to rush out the door and, and one of my kids is trying to tell me a story and I'm like, yeah, no, tell me, yep, yeah. oh, that's great, yeah, uh-huh, yep, yep, no, yep. And the reality is, did I hear a thing? No, I wanted to have the perception that I was listening, but my mind was already in the next space. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't mourn or rejoice with someone in a hurry. You ever had a friend or a loved one show up in your life, they're in crisis, and you're like, all right, you got 30 seconds. Time. How I many know mourning and rejoicing with people does not work like that? It doesn't work like that. You, you can't be known or know others in a hurry. Again, I want to remind you, community takes connection. Connection requires time. Time is a choice. Consider the words in Hebrews chapter 10. It says this, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Since he who promised is faithful. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. Jesus is faithful. Man, he's faithful. He's good. And so we hold on to the confession of our faith, knowing that he's faithful. And in light of his faithfulness, listen to the next instruction. And let us watch out for one another to provoke. Can you say provoke? Provoke, provoke love and good works. Not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. You see, Scripture is reminding us there's certain things that we cannot do or become if I choose to remain disconnected. We need connection with one another. But encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I love that this Scripture says this, that, that we are to consider one another. Two different times, it says, let us. Let us hold fast to the confession of our faith. Let us provoke one. I love that scripture uses the word provoke. Some translations say stir up. Here's what that word means in the original Greek. It literally means to be an irritation. So guess what your assignment is this week? You get to be an irritation. You get to irritate somebody. Well, Tyler... I don't want to irritate, and I definitely don't want anybody to irritate. But, but notice what it says. To irritate one another toward love and good works. You see, this is the danger. As I stay isolated, I don't have to worry about bugging anybody else, and I don't have to worry about anybody else bugging me. In other words, I don't have to worry about irritation. Nobody's going to call me on my junk. Nobody's going to call me out for not being loving. Nobody's going to call me out for, for just sitting and not actually engaging in good works that my faith is designed to engage in. This is why we need connection, though, because there's times in my life that I need to be irritated by somebody else. I need to be stirred up or provoked by somebody else. Hey, what you're doing right now isn't loving. That attitude isn't loving. Hey, you're called to good works. You're called to greatness. You're called to reveal the love and the life of Jesus. Come on, get active in this, Tyler. Tyler. I can't do that without connection. You see, knowing others and being known by others are both a choice. They're both a choice. But here's the challenge. There's no, no shortcut 
to building friendships. There's no shortcut to building community and relationships. No doubt you've heard it said, what comes easy, it won't last. But also, what lasts doesn't come easy. It, it takes time, it takes intentionality, it takes some, some effort. So when you make the choice to create margin in relationships with others, especially in the area of biblical community, you're moving one step closer to the good life. I'm convinced we cannot experience the good life without Jesus. And life with Jesus pulls me into connection with other followers of Jesus. There's a couple things that we find when we make the decision to move towards connection. Number one is this. We, we find strength that provides safety. Strength that provides safety. In fact, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. How many of you have gotten into one of your yards, your backyard, your front yard in the last couple of weeks, and you had to do some weeding? Let me see a show of hands. How many of you would love to have not done that by yourself but had somebody else helping you or doing it for you, right? Two are better than one. Two are better than one. There's a better reward or return for their efforts. It says this, for if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. Friends, pity number 750. Why? Because 750 fell somewhere, and either a dog ate him, the vacuum ate him, the air vent ate him, but he's gone. There wasn't a connection. It's lost. Pity the one who has no one to help them back up. And verse 12, if somebody overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Here becomes the danger when we think that we don't really need biblical community. We don't need connection with the body of Christ. The danger is this. The body is missing the part that you bring. So we'll never be complete, Life Center, unless everybody is bringing the part that they are designed to play. But also, understand this. You are missing the part that the body is designed to bring towards you. That's the strength. That's the safety. There's, there's not only strength in numbers. Hear me, there is safety in numbers. Amen? There's safety in numbers. My firstborn, I shared this a number of weeks ago. He got his permit. He finally graduated driver's ed. Come on, somebody. But, but I noticed an interesting thing that he started doing. We'll get in the car, and I'm, I'm finishing sending a message or something, and all of a sudden I'll hear this. <clears throat> I'll look over at him. He's like, I will start the car once your seatbelt is buckled. <laughs> I look at him, I'm, I've been driving longer than you've been alive. You know, that's, that's my reaction. But, but here's the point. When it comes to a seatbelt, you don't need it until you need it. But the only way it does something for you is if it's connected. Can I tell you? When it comes to biblical community, you don't need it until you need it. But it only works when it's connected. And can I tell you, when your life is in a fast, head-on collision, at that point, it's a little bit of an inconvenient time to decide, you know, connection's probably pretty important. You gotta make the decision before the collision. See, that's where the safety and the strength come from. We, we decide to connect. Why? Because life has a way of bringing challenges that we're all going to come up against at different moments. Here's what I love about community. You see, we don't just receive this from others and hold it for ourselves. We also are called to extend this. See, when I connect in the body of Christ, I, I receive that safety and that strength but I'm also called to be a source or a conduit for others. Because listen, there's people who need you in Life Center. They need you to use your gifts. They need you to get active in serving. They need you to invest your time, your talent, your treasure in seeing God work in and through your life. So it's not just what we receive, it's, it's what we also are called 
to give. But here's the second thing that happens when I make the choice to connect. I experience truth that leads to growth. I experience truth that leads to growth. I love this scripture, Proverbs 27, verse 6. It says this, the wounds of a friend are trustworthy. How many of us wake up in the morning and say, man, I hope I get wounded by one of my friends today, right? What's the point? All of us, we need voices in our lives who will be willing to tell us what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. And sometimes those words, it hits us at a level that it feels a little bit like a wound. But much like a scalpel in the hand of a doctor who who cuts us and wounds us, he's not cutting and wounding us for our hurt. He's actually cutting and wounding us so that we would heal. That's why scripture calls us to speak the truth in love. We need to hear truth. But the problem is sometimes when I'm isolated or alone or I refuse connection, I'm in a place where I can't receive it, but I also can't give it. I learned a long time ago, when I surround myself by others, it pushes me to move beyond where I'm currently at. This is true in my faith. It's true in my leadership. It's true in physical activity. It's it's true in so many different areas of our lives. When when we get around others, it, it pushes us to be better. We need truth that will cause us to grow. What I love about connection with Jesus, connection with Jesus, it should move me to deeper connection with other Jesus followers. And connection with Jesus followers, guess what that does in my life? It moves me to deeper connection with Jesus. I need both working together. I need both speaking truth in me. And that the reality is I, I don't just get this, I'm also called to, to give it, but I can't give something if I'm disconnected and I can't get something if I'm disconnected. So today, I challenge all of us to consider it. Consider it. You are a unique individual piece. Listen, there, there's multiple shapes in the room. There's multiple shades in the room. We, we are all different, but we are all created. We are all created for connection. You're designed for it. Connection with God, yes, but also connection with others. Connection with others, with God's family. And so today, Think about that, strength and safety and and truth and growth. We, We need those things. But again, I bring us back to where we started. Community takes connection. Connection requires time. Time is a choice. Today, as we bring this to a conclusion, here's what I wanna ask. Everybody grab that connect card. Don't let that be lost on you. Connection card. Well, Tyler, I don't want to fill that out. It takes time. And the amount of time this will take will be about five to 10 seconds. But it's worth it. Because we want to help you move to deeper places of connection. Today, I want to talk about two next steps. And I'd love for everybody to, to grab one of these, fill these out. If it's your first time at Life Center, I'd love to fill, have you fill it out. Because we want to follow up with you and connect with you. If you've been here a long time and you've never filled one of these out, I want you to fill one of these out. We want to help people, in light of what we're learning from Scripture, take some next steps. So today, this is our first next step, and it's always our first next step. Maybe today is your day to say yes to Jesus. I want to remind you, you were created for connection with God. But how we connect with God is never through our earning. It's never through our effort. It's not even through attending enough church. Connection with God is only received by receiving what Jesus has done for you through his life, his death, and his resurrection. That's how we experience salvation. It's through grace. Today, maybe that's your next step. If that's you, check that box because we want to help you move from that decision to walking every day with Jesus. That's called discipleship. If that's you, check that box. Check that box. Here's the second next step. Maybe some of us today, we have to make the step to choose community. Choose community. If that's you, write write that down. I'm I'm gonna choose community. And and here's what that means for some of us, because some of us, we're in a habit of attending church, 
But some of us, we need to make that shift that I'm not just going to receive from church, I'm going to help connect with others. I'm gonna give strength, I'm gonna give truth, I'm gonna give encouragement, I'm gonna connect with others relationally, I'm gonna connect in a ministry, start serving, I'm gonna connect in a life group or in a class. I want to move forward. So today, what's your next step? Can I invite you to join me in a word of prayer as we consider that? Jesus, thank you that you do all things well. Lord, thank you for the work that you've done for us that we could have connection, we could have relationship with our Heavenly Father. And God, I pray that today we would be reminded that connection isn't just something that that we receive with you, it's something that we're called to live out with others, with the body of Christ. So would you give us wisdom? Would you help us create margin and create space? No matter our personality type or or how busy life may be, help us to each make that decision with our time. Today, maybe it's your desire to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you check that first box. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna invite all of Life Center to pray this prayer with those who are maybe praying this for the very first time today. Can you say these words? Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me. I put my trust in you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new creation. And help me to follow you every day of my life. It's in your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate those who are making that decision today?